but I will start by introducing myself. My name is Penila Hogbert. I will be moderating this webinar today. And uh, this webinar on Citizens' Assemblies for Transition is organized by the research program Mistra Sustainable Consumption, which is hosted here at KTH, where both me and uh, my co-organizer, Claudine Bradley, are located at the Department of Urban Planning and Environment. Uh, and the background to, to this webinar and the framing of the webinar is and protect, perhaps particularly topical with, uh, with COP going on, uh, is this uh, strive for new ways of thinking about how we can organize and plan society for a more sustainable future. Uh, and both in academia and practice, we're seeing an increased interest in so-called deliberative or participatory methods to address uh, both climate and other ecological and social issues. And one approach in particular that we'll be talking about, but using perhaps different uh, different uh, language or, or terms for this is so-called citizens assemblies or citizen councils, citizen juries, uh, different, different names um, that are basically tasked with developing proposals for transition that are anchored in citizen groups. And uh, there are assumptions made that these types of processes, uh, deliberative and participatory methods can mediate both policy acceptance but also contribute to more far-reaching transformations. Um, and this webinar takes a starting point in, in sort of asking, are we, what are we expecting of citizens' assemblies and, and the likes? Are we expecting too much? Or how could such processes be leveraged to actually spur transformative change? And as citizens' uh, citizens' assemblies have been tested in, in various parts of Europe and around the world. This is more recently um, brought also into the Swedish context, where we'll be hearing from presenters today on how this is being developed in, in the Swedish national and municipal local level. Um, and we will hear both about a Swedish National Climate Assembly and the work in, for example, the Swedish Food Agency and the municipality of Gothenburg. But I will get back to that. And the purpose of this webinar is really to exchange experiences and get inspiration and learn from citizens' assemblies in other countries. So we'll be starting off with international outlooks from France and Finland. But before I present our other participants, I want to leave the word to Karin Bradley to briefly introduce Mr. Sustainable Consumption and the sub-project that me and Karin are working on uh, that relates to the topic of today's webinar. Okay, good. Yes, so as Penilla mentioned, this uh, the seminar is hosted by the research program, Mr. Sustainable Consumption, and uh, it is an eight-year transdisciplinary program developing knowledge uh, intended to be useful for transitions to more sustainable consumption practices uh, with a particular focus on, on Sweden, but also with international outlooks. Uh, and as part of this larger program, uh, Penilla and I are leading a project uh, on public policy experiments, uh, where we explore how public sector actors, uh, that is particularly municipalities, are testing new ways of working in order to promote transitions. And one such approach that we find very interesting and, and promising is the ongoing work with the citizen assemblies. So that's in short what we're doing, uh, and we'll be uh, working with this uh, throughout uh, 2024 and, and 2025. So over to you, Pernilla. There, okay, sorry about that. So let's move on then to the knowledge exchange and we're very happy to be joined by both uh, by Swedish and European researchers and practitioners working with citizen assemblies in different ways and as I said using different slightly different vocabularies for this and I should say that you're very welcome to post questions in the Q&A uh, that you will find at the lower uh, bottom of your screen in the Zoom uh, and these are questions that I won't bring up with the panelists during their presentations, but things might pop up in your head while they're presenting. So please write down your questions 
and I'll bring them to the panel discussion after all of the presentations. And if there's a question already written that you find particularly relevant and you would like to, to be asked, uh, I think there should be a possibility for you to like that question. So you can uh, sort of vote for, for questions. Um, and yes, I think uh, that's all I need to say. And the, by that, I would like to first introduce um, Mathil Boye, who leads uh, Democracy and Climate Initiatives and is working on a project on democratic innovation and just transitions. And she'll be presenting insights from a report on citizens' assemblies and the climate emergency for the World Resources Institute, where she is also affiliated. Uh, and Mathilde has also served as a French diplomat in the negotiations for the Sustainable Development Goals and the climate negotiations for France. So please, Mathilde, go ahead. Many thanks, uh, Bernouya and Karine, for your introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to share with you today a few highlights of uh, our global research work we have been carried out at the World Resources Institute on citizens' assemblies and the climate emergency. So have you have just mentioned, um, despite a global democratic backsliding, there is a growing interest for citizen assemblies and especially assemblies that are dealing with environmental issues. There is a global wave of climate assemblies that originated uh, from Europe and uh, is now spreading from Dominican Republic to Japan. Those processes uh, have a very strong track record and must uh, fulfill very well their mandate. Um, the commissioners and experts welcome the quality of the recommendations, citizen proposals put forward, uh, offer new measures in uh, public and political debates and uh, are going further than uh, politicians in, uh, in many uh, sectors. Participants uh, are usually very satisfied with uh, their experience in uh, citizen assemblies and many of them adopt more sustainable behaviors at the end uh, of the process. However, those uh, processes have very, very various levels of influence in policymaking and actually many have limited impact on policymaking. So governments usually uh, give answers to those processes that are quite vague and doesn't say how the citizen's proposal is going to be implemented. When the proposals are fed into policies, legislations, cities, climate change plans, they are often cherry picked or and watered down. The best examples we have in terms of implementation of citizens' proposals come from Poland, where a few mayors committed to systematically implement citizens' proposals that would be supported by 80% of the panels, and they do so. So how we can uh, enhance the influence of climate assemblies and more broadly citizen assemblies on the ecology at a time where there is a big gap in uh, the public response to this crisis? So our first parameter is to empower those processes the climate assemblies that have been organized so far are mainly informative. They are given an advisory role for government, and most of them are invited to give preference on strategic orientations or existing climate measures. Very few had the space to formulate new measures. And the policy space citizens are given really matter for the quality of the outcome. There is a uh, very big difference in, in the reports between uh, the, the different uh, citizen assemblies. In a nutshell, uh, the bigger is the room for maneuver, more ambitious are or can be the proposals. The citizens have uh, more space to be innovative and uh, to move the needle. There is also a kind of correlation between the strength of the commitment commissioners are taking initially from the outset and the implementation of the measures. Here, what matters perhaps even more uh, than the type of commitments is the clarity of the commitments. There is a, a growing consensus among experts and practitioners to call for legislative requirements uh, um, to publish an argued response within a specific timeframe. 
with a timeable for the implementation of the measures. It's also very important to plan ahead the follow-up process. We have seen with the experience of the French Convention on Climate uh, that having unclarity on how the implementation of the proposals will be tracked can lead to very confusing results. In spring 2021, for instance, the French government was saying that 87 measures were already implemented, while the 150 association established by assembly members were counting only 13 measures that would be implemented. So it's very important, if possible, to have an independent follow-up process. A track that is currently explored to enhance the influence of citizens' assemblies on climate and the ecology is to establish uh, permanent processes, so to institutionalize those processes. The city of Milan, the region of Brussels, uh, have set up such permanent climate citizens' assemblies. So they are in charge of uh, choosing the topic that's going to handle uh, one half temporary citizens' assemblies. There are also a growing number of cities that uh, establish uh, adversary councils on ecological transitions. So those councils are really plugged into cities' uh, local governance for the transitions. So those experiences are very inspiring. Uh, they give uh, some insurances on the, the follow-up process and provide a clear link with decision-making. Some experts and practitioners also call for developing a strong influence strategy, because even when you have an institutionalized process, you don't have guarantee that government is going to implement citizens' proposals. German's uh, Climate Assembly uh, provide an interesting example of uh, assembly organized by civil society organizations ahead of federal election. Uh, and we have a very strong influence strategy. Uh, the assembly uh, had designated a champion uh, here, the former president, uh, Hurst Keller, to promote uh, citizens' proposals. There was also a very strong communication strategy and a campaign with a coalition of NGOs, academics, politicians, uh, to put pressure on, on the government. The supporters of uh, those experiences uh, states that climate assemblies have to do more than just inform government. They have to push for more broader societal conversation. So they have to make noise, they have to get teeth uh, to be more influential. Another key lever to increase the influence of those processes is to make them more focused. Most climate assemblies so far uh, had very broad scope. They were called to uh, reflect upon how the government or the city can deal with climate change. So there is a growing consensus among experts to uh, invite uh, assemblies with a, a narrower scope so they can focus on controversies, on uh, issues uh, dealing with uh, climate justice, on phase-out scenarios, so uh, on really difficult matters. There is also a growing acknowledgement that citizen assemblies on climate ecological issues have been framed so far in a very technical way. And it would be important to foster a more societal uh, conversation to approach um, issues related with uh, visions, values, and system change. The Scotland's uh, Climate Assembly reflected upon, uh, for instance, uh, different future scenarios and the values that underpinned those scenarios. Uh, the French Convention on Climate also tried to uh, think of political economy issues. Um, so the power dynamics, uh, the role of lobbies, the flows of investment uh, that um, influence the uptake of more ambitious uh, proposal. There is also um, a growing recognition of the importance to go beyond a consideration of DAG emission reduction targets to adopt an ecosystem approach to also look at biodiversity and other societal issues. Social justice is a very important topic that have been under addressed by climate assemblies so far. So definitely participants have very strong concern for equity in their measures, but they haven't had the time or the capacity to fully address this issue. So here it's important to delegate more time, uh, expert support and, and data so that the assemblies are able 
to delve into the complexity of the social impacts of the measures they are looking at. Finally, the link with the broader public is extremely important to uh, foster a broader societal conversation. And the climate assemblies recently have adopted uh, other criteria than demographic and sociological criteria to better reflect societal debates. They are considering the attitudes of people toward the topic, the behaviors. Um, they are also uh, targeting vulnerable groups for instance, the Citizens Agora on Just Transitions that uh, was organized this year in the Bristol region included representatives from vulnerable, vulnerable groups targeted with uh, social NGOs. And some countries also including children. This is about the future after all, and uh, they don't have voting rights. So the Scotland organized discussion between the Climate Assembly and the Children's Parliaments on the climate measures. Communications matters a lot. Uh, the climate assemblies that have had the biggest influence, all those also that had uh, the largest budget for communication and plan interviews of participants and many tactics to reach out to the media, uh, for instance, collaboration with social media influencers. There are also uh, recent uh, experiences that try to um, encourage local community debates that echo the deliberation within a citizen assembly to foster those broader conversation. Uh, the French Citizen Convention on Climate uh, lets uh, participants organize public meetings. Uh, global, the Global Assembly on Climate and Biodiversity invited NGOs and, and local communities to organize dialogues that would fill the broader uh, the, the, the deliberation of the assembly. So that's an interesting way because most uh, assemblies so far have relied on online consultations organized before or during the assembly. And uh, those had been very challenging because they require a lot of resources and time to synthesize and digest the inputs from the public. So cascading the public discussion from the citizen assembly to, to the local is in, an interesting path to, to follow. Thank you. So there's where the, the few points I wanted to share and I'm looking forward to uh, the debate later. Thank you so much, Mathilde, and very, very valuable to get this uh, overview and this report that you've uh, done and that will be published uh, next year. Um, so as I said, if you've just entered the webinar, we will be uh, taking part of uh, presentations now for the first hour. And if you have questions that emerge, please write them in the Q&A function. And then I will post these questions during the panel debate towards the end of the webinar. Um, so following up this um, presentation from Mathilde and the perspectives and, and kind of getting the broad overview of where the current situation and current issues for climate assemblies and citizen assemblies uh, lie, we want to invite uh, Heli Sadikowski, who is a leading researcher at the Finnish Environment Institute, and her researchers, research focuses on deliberative environmental governance and co-knowledge production in these types of science-intensive environmental disputes that also Matilda uh, addressed. So Heli, please uh, share with us the example from the Finnish context that you have studied. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for the introductions. Let me see, uh, share screen, right? Window. We practiced this, so I should be able to do this. Share, here we go. And uh, I guess now I'm sharing. Does it work? Can you see it? Yes, it's working great. Good, excellent. So, yeah, so uh, hello, everybody. My name is Heli Sarikoski, and I work at the Finnish Environment Institute. And the topic of my presentation is uh, Citizens' Jury on carbon neutral transport in Uusimaa region. I have a little bit cold, so apologies for sounding a little congested, but I should manage this 10 minute presentation. So, uh, oops, just a sec. 
Right. Okay. So the um, the uh, Uzuma uh, tra transport jury we organize it together with uh, Uzuma Regional Council, which has an ambitious goal to reach carbon neutrality by two thousand and thirty-five. And uh, road transport accounts for around thirty percentage of all the uh, emissions. So it's then essential to cut down uh, the emissions from automo automobile traffic. However, uh, these uh, transport policy measures, they also have social, social impacts like increased fuel costs or other negative impacts. So the regional council was keen to hear that what do the citizens think about the uh, proposed policy measures and how could those measures be implemented in an efficient and just manner? And as, as researchers, we were interested in, in the question that whether the jurors became more approving of transport policy instruments after deliberation. That's kind of the deliberative theory hypothesis, if you like. So, um, and the Uusimaa region, for those who are not from Finland, that's in the south, southern part of Finland, Helsinki is part of Uusimaa region. And um, so a, a central element of deliberative mini publics is that people are randomly selected and they represent the average population in the area. So uh, to achieve that, we send an uh, invitation to 6,000 randomly selected people, uh, 400 persons volunteered. We picked 40 people from the group and then uh, eventually 32 stayed till the end of the process. And uh, the jurors represented quite well the average Uusima residents in terms of demographic variables. Men were a little overrepresented, perhaps because uh, men are more interested in transport political questions, or, but, but otherwise the uh, jury was fairly representative. And residence was a very important criterion because the circumstances are very different in Helsinki metropolitan region with good public transport connections and then in the sparsely populated rural areas in eastern and western Uusimaa. And we also had one attitude variable as a selection criterion because we wanted to ensure that the jurors are not more environmentally aware than people in Finland in general, or that they would have been a bias towards people that strongly oppose any restrictions of private motoring. So we uh, used uh, one question from the Finnish climate barometer, which is that the use of low carbon energy should be increased in Finland, regardless of the impacts on en energy prices. And the jurors had pretty similar opinions on this issue compared to Finnish people on average. And here's the jury process. We had a, a fairly standard four-day jury process with five-hour meetings. And I think that the, there was this question about terminology. So I guess that there's a report by OECD which says that if there is a four-day uh, jury with with uh, around 40, um, 35 people or so, that's citizen jury. Whereas if you have a climate assembly then tends to engage around 100 people and it lasts over several weekends, four or five, something like that. So that's why we call it citizen jury. And uh, one uh, lesson learned was that the time was a bit too short. As uh, Mathilde uh, said that it's uh, it's really important to have uh, that this issues are complex and, and the scope is sometimes too broad so then it really people need to take time to familiarize themselves with, with the issues. The, uh, the meetings took place during the weekends and, and therefore we also had one expert hearing session online. It was difficult to uh, get experts uh, participate in the weekend meetings and, uh, and then we also had uh, then a session with the policymakers who were uh, committed to receive the recommendations from the jury. They did not promise to act on them, but they promised to receive and, and consider them and then 
give a statement that how, how they will use it. Uh, here are some examples of the recommendations. Um, at the outset, most jurors, they were quite skeptical of the prospects of uh, vehicle electrification. They found that uh, electric cars are far too expensive for ordinary people and, and several proposed that uh, we, 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 uh, that the alternative would be use biofuels instead. There's biofuel converters, they are easy to install and they are relatively inexpensive. However, the participants learned from the expert presentations that the biofuels production capacity is not sufficient to decarbonize automobile transport and therefore they eventually adapted the view that vehicle electrification is, is the key to cut down emissions. And when they reached these conclusions, they also came up with a practical solution to make electric cars more affordable. At the moment, there is a government subsidy for quite expensive uh, cars and people felt that if you can afford a 50,000 euro car, you really don't need any support. But then instead of targeting it to the lower price range cars, uh, more people could benefit from that. And then uh, the question that uh, did deliberation increase environmental awareness. So there was some support for the assumption. Now I need to read side words. Uh, so the, there's, uh, we asked the participants questions, uh, the same question before and after the process. And the first question is that the emissions from passenger cars are considerable and therefore private motoring should be reduced significantly. And uh, far more people agreed with this statement after the process than before. And this uh, difference was statistically significant. There was also a question about the uh, prospects of public transport, whether people think that that's a feasible answer. And again, after the process, people were more sort of optimistic about the prospects of public transport. Um, the jurors also learned about the issues. Uh, for instance, there were uh, some jurors in the beginning who, who suggested that uh, that the emissions in Finland, they are quite small and the, the problem should be addressed elsewhere. One person said that we should put pipes in the... In, in, okay, right. <laughs> need to see that but anyway so the people learned that uh that during the discussion that carbon emissions are not not same as particle emissions and due to their global nature we are all responsible for their reduction so the, the participants did assume more responsibility for climate change mitigation during the process however unlike some deliberative theorists have suggested the process did not create wide support for very ambitious climate policy Experts were uh, unanimous that economic instruments like uh, fuel carbon taxes are the most e effective ones, but the jurors nevertheless adapted a cautious approach to them and recommended that positive incentives should have a priority over negative ones. Right, then there is some uh, feedback from the participants. It was generally very positive. We were very happy that all participants felt that the citizen jury statement represented well their own views and they all, all felt that the participants listened to each other and respected the other's viewpoints, which is quite important. One of the biggest shortcomings of the process was that there was not enough time to, for all participants to learn about the issue and this goes back to the question of the scope. So, uh, yeah, and this is one of the biggest challenges in climate assemblies and juries in general. So, uh, to conclude, the uh, results suggest that deliberative mini publics can indeed result in considered and well balanced recommendations on complex environmental policy problems. And also, the jury provided valuable information for the regional authorities on the lived experiences of the citizens, which then helps the authorities to design better policy measures. But on the last note, uh, as uh, Mathilde said, the rationale of climate juries and assemblies ultimately depends on the actual use of the outputs and therefore f further resources needed and the perspectives of policymakers on the use and usefulness of deliberative mini publics in supporting climate action and sustainability transformations. Thank you. And here is a reference to the paper 
uh, which has then more information about the case. Great. Thank you so much, Hilly. And uh, welcome to any new uh, audience members that have joined us. So we're taking part. This was our second presentation. And now we will move on to uh, the Swedish context. So we've now heard from the French and the Finnish uh, examples. And we will be moving on to the Swedish context and especially the process of developing a national climate assembly. So presenting uh, next will be Tim Daw, who is an associate professor in sustainability sciences at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And he researches the potential of deliberative mini publics, a term you've already heard Haley mention now, for sustainable transformations, and is one of the organizers for the Swedish Climate Assembly that's set to take place in 2020, 2024. Sorry. So Tim, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Pranilla. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. And uh, thanks for the invitation here. So I'm going to talk about this uh, Medborja Råd om Klimatet, which is Sweden's first national climate assembly. A little bit of the context has been given uh, already. Um, so um, I'll just start with where this has come from. Um, uh, this has been initiated, initiated by a research project called Fairtrans, which basically aims to promote transformations to a, a fair and fossil-free future. Um, and the, the overall project has this mission to develop a science-based and fair roadmaps for rapid decarbonization, consistent with the Swedish carbon budget, through collaboration with key actors from civil society. So um, on the, this slide, you can see some of the Fairtrans partners. Um, five different universities, um, but particularly some of the big civil society organizations, including the big unions or unions of unions, um, as well as some um, a housing association here, um, the Sweden's biggest uh, um, conservation NGO, and Hela Sveriska Lieva, which is a sort of network of local um, organizations that are th throughout uh, Sweden, particularly in the in the more rural areas, and. So there are 5 million members in the, 5 million people are members of the organizations who are partners in the Fair Trans program. So that provides a good legitimacy to develop these uh, sort of science-based roadmap. But of course, there are people in Sweden who aren't members of these organizations. And, you know, so it was recognized that where where is the actual, the raw citizen's voice in this process? Um, so um, Fairtrans board, the, the board for this research project, decided to uh, to organize a climate assembly. And this was decided in spring 2022. And it's important that this was before the national election. Um, so this is in no way a, a reaction to uh, the election or the current politics. Uh, it's been planned for a while. And the purpose is for a group of randomly selected citizens to deliberate, identify and present suggestions for how Sweden can meet its commitment to the Paris Agreement. Um, so uh, briefly of the practicalities of where we're at so far. Um, so it's overseen by a, a consultation group of well-known individuals from across political spectrum and from civil society. Um, we have some international advisors who are experts in, in climate assemblies. Um, and we will be recruiting 60 people. The aim is to have at least 50 people who, who are 50 members at the end of the process. So we will recruit 60 to be sure of that. So we have a consultancy who is doing that sortition process. Um, and our stratification variables are, um, who would you vote for if there was an election tomorrow? Um, how concerned are you about the climate? Uh, and, then, and the usual uh, demographics, education, geography. Um, and we'll try and get from a range of postal codes Home postal codes, uh, which reflects the income levels, which aggregated at postcode level. So to have people from high and low uh, income areas, um, and uh, so that will that process will start uh, in January. And then in terms of the actual design and facilitation, um, so that's going to be done by uh, Digitem Lab, who we're going to see hear from soon about another process uh, with the support of the Danish Board of Technology. So. Um, a very um, experienced um, consultant is going to deliver that. And the si size of the process we're looking at is two weekends in person uh, plus five online evenings. And it will start in March and it will run to May. 
So particular features of, of this compared to some other climate assemblies. So obviously this is initiated by um, Swedish universities. Uh, so it's politically independent. So it's not part of any formal decision process. It's not mandated by any government authority and it doesn't, the recommendations won't go naturally into some pipeline of policy decisions. Um, another feature that we're keen to maintain is that the members themselves will have some influence on the agenda and that they will discuss broader systems perspectives, uh, not only uh, technical measures. Um, so our impact strategy, um, we hope that the, uh, the, the political parties and the government and the parliament will be interested in this and we'll be looking to share the process and the results um, with them. But our impact strategy is really to try and support a more informed and nuanced public and political discussion. So to provide a wide range of people, uh, fellow citizens, media, civil society, government with an informed view that's independent from organized interests, um, to provoke discussion on, on relevant principles, which need to be thought about in terms of how we address climate change, fairness, growth, sufficiency, efficiency, limits, limits competitiveness, um, demonstrate how a diverse group of citizens can agree on certain proposals, and importantly, try and explain the reasoning behind those supported proposals, rather than just a long list of recommendations. We want to make sure that the uh, the reasoning is is explicit. Um, and we also hope to uh, support and create space for uh, for systems thinking. Um, so just to step back a little bit, reflecting on the international experience so far, there has been some critique, and uh, Mathilde also referred to this, that some assemblies are miss the bigger picture of structural issues and, and, and the need for system change. And this could be due to the fact they focus in on, on sectoral or technical topic groups, um, or maybe because they're time pressured to produce a lot of recommendations on a lot of topics. Um, also, as I mentioned before, most national climate assemblies have been government mandated, but there is an argument um, that independent climate assemblies might have more potential because they, there's a free scope to critique any existing structures and to raise controversial perspectives. Um, and uh, another feature is that most citizen assemblies have relied rely on sort of traditional textual and discursive evidence. So uh, experts speaking to the participants and uh, there hasn't been a lot of experimentation with experiential or interactive learning. So we're looking into the possibility of using, uh, for example, um, interactive modeling tools like this. Some of you may have uh, seen this uh, very interesting, interactive, uh, nicely designed modeling tool coming from MIT, uh, En-ROADS. Um, and there is already a, an established um, uh, process by which um, people can interact with this model through a kind of role-playing game, and it really helps people to understand the bigger picture. Um, some of the trade-offs we've been struggling with, um, and I think this also reflects in some of the other uh, processes, is um, trade-off between a focused or a broad remit, where a focused remit, for example, transport, you know, gives you something very specific, tangible recommendations that can go to policymakers, more time for learning, and more diverse experts on a particular topic and deeper deliberation. Um, but a broad uh, remit can have uh, give citizens more empowerment to drive the agenda, more creative uh, solutions, maybe thinking more about structural factors and maybe more generally interesting for participants. Very interesting to hear that men were more uh, turned up more for the transportation um, uh, uh, citizen uh, jury there. That's a discussion that we've had within our team. Um, and then between a, a directed focus, uh, where we, the designers and the consultation group, say this is what's going to be discussed, or a participant-led, which gives more democratic legitimacy. So obviously there's a trade-off between efficiency and legitimacy there. Um, so the way that we're uh, planning this now is to have a broad introduction with a systems perspective. So there's time to discuss the bigger picture, um, and Sweden's place within the world, but then the members will choose a focus on controversial topics um, to discuss in detail, such as uh, transport and energy in the Swedish context. Um, a few risks and mitigations. Uh, the biggest risk, according to our advisors, is that nobody pays any attention. So uh, we really uh, hope that we can have success interaction with the media. We have a quite well-known consultation group 
we're looking for a, an ambassador or a champion we're in the process of hoping we can recruit that and we hope that the participants will feel ownership and speak on behalf of the assembly um there's concern could it be hijacked by special interest groups too much love or opposed vividly by other groups so how we position ourselves and how we are then positioned by other groups and social media um is something that we uh, we will have to navigate um we hope to maintain integrity as a university-led assembly um, we're not affiliated to any uh, um, protest groups um, and we um, and we're very keen that we don't we're not easily dismissed as biased so uh, the participants can't be seen as biased we need to have this um, uh, stratification variables in terms of party sympathy and climate concern uh, and we've got a reasonably generous uh, payment uh, to encourage a broad range of people to attend. Um, and uh, we also want to be open to the participants to invite particular experts. Um, and we're anchoring our decisions on the evidence with our, with our consultation group as well. Okay, so the next steps, it was launched publicly last week. We're um, designing the letter for recruitment this week, and that will be going out in the second week of January. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. And I'm sure we will get back to uh, questions on, on this process. Um, so if you uh, have looked into the uh, Q&A, you've seen that there are a few questions already and please pose questions there as we listen to the presentations. And you can also use the little function of um, voting through a thumbs up, liking, the questions that you want to be posed at the panel debate, since we won't be taking questions um, individually now, but we'll save them all for the final panel debate. So next up is uh, Steph Toro, who will be um, sharing experiences from Vigidem Lab, as you also heard Tim mention, who will be involved in the National Climate Assembly. And Steph is the project leader and outreach strategist at Vigidem Lab based in Gothenburg, and they work with testing and implementing methods for participatory democracy in public institutions. And Steph will be sharing a few of the, the projects and ways this is being implemented uh, right now in Sweden. So please, Steph, go ahead. And um, like I said, I'm based in Gothenburg in Sweden, and I have a bit of a different perspective than some of the other folks here today as a practitioner of uh, some of these methods. And um, just want to start out by saying that we're an independent and nonprofit democracy lab, and we work on participatory democracy approaches. We study, we test them, and we implement them uh, both locally here in Sweden and in other places abroad. And um, we collaborate and we study and we disseminate. And I think it's important to mention this because we uh, work a lot with digital tools and we believe in open source and open code. And so we study international approaches and when we bring them back, we want to disseminate that knowledge to all kinds of different actors. Um, we also participate in uh, research studies, uh, the latest one, um, a Nordic study on that is called Cold Digit um, in collaboration with uh, different universities in the Nordics, as well as Nesta in the UK. And um, before I go on to talk about climate assemblies in particular, uh, I just want to stop and say that we support these organizations, um, both on the local and global level, uh, in order to be able to see how implementation varies. We've implemented uh, deliberatory methodologies in the schools in Gothenburg, for example. We've implemented um, um, citizen budgets in the city of New York. And across all of these experiences, we find that participants, um, no matter what their age is, no matter what their geographic locations, are putting climate on the agenda again and again. And before I step into talking about climate assemblies um, in particular, I want to also go back to what you were saying initially, Pernilla, about uh, framing how we can talk 
about a sustainable future. And I want to go back to some of the protests that were happening in Spain um, after the economic crisis and across Europe, where people were gathering together and saying that um, some of their politicians are corrupt. There's a privatization of both water and other public services. And where are the jobs? And having a lot of communities get together, finding platforms to discuss both digital and physical and coming up with solutions for a better tomorrow and solutions that are better for the people. And as um, Mathilde was showing on the global map of CA, we've seen that type of implementation in lots of different places. So some of these pictures are from Paris, some of them are from Chicago and other cities. And we're talking about both participatory budgeting, but also citizen assemblies. And this sort of move towards decentralizing decision-making has been very important. We have to place it in a context of where, uh, for example, in Sweden, we have 2% of people are engaged currently in political parties, which is the main way that people can actually affect decision-making and affect change. And so what we've found is that these initiatives are a way of trying to reclaim that power uh, over your own community and um, take that decision-making to other levels where you can get these lived experiences from the community. So we know that citizens are able to propose more innovative and sustainable solutions than politicians at time. And this is because politicians are uh, sometimes hindered by uh, the nature of political debate, by the um, demonizing of different political counterparts, um, and instead are able to focus on knowledge citizens are able to focus on knowledge and focus on deliberation in order to deliver more representative and more legitimate recommendations than sometimes our political systems allowed, speaking very broadly. And some of the learnings and effects of climate assemblies, um, we've seen some of them talked about today. Um, there is a high level of satisfaction among folks who have participated in climate assemblies they result in more sustainable behaviors. Um, we've talked about how uh, it can offer um, a more legitimized approach for some of these recommendations rather than some of the um, more, I guess, traditional activist organizations that um, some folks are organizing into. And we can also break political deadlock and also understand how are ordinary citizens actually prioritizing climate action. And for a lot of um, public sector participants in the webinar today, this is also a very good way to fulfill commitments to engage citizens in uh, transitions and in climate action in your local municipalities or regions. And I wanna say something briefly on the Conference on the Future of Europe, because this is something that Digidem Lab was able to both um, assist in the planning of, also the provide a digital platform for, as well as um, facilitate uh, one of the largest citizen dialogues across Europe with all 27 EU member states involved and over 800 participants. And not all of the groups focused on climate, but Climate was on the agenda. I am going to very briefly say something about the National Climate Assembly in France. And Mathilde, you already covered this um, very well. And uh, what I want to say is that some of these recommendations were quite bold and quite um, innovative, such as uh, banning flights when train options are less than two hours away. But what we found was that in the legislative implementation, that's where some of these issues arose, um, the unclarity and how they were gonna be implemented and the follow-up. And I think that's something that maybe we can focus on in our panel discussion later on how to mitigate some of these effects and how to work around those. 
And now I get to talk about Sweden's first citizen assembly with the Swedish Food Agency. And this is so exciting because in the spring of 2023, um, the Swedish Food Agency or Livsmedelsverket um, got in touch with us about implementing the first national citizen assembly. And um, what we had was one question and it was a pretty broad question, but a question that also took into account some of these issues on justice. So what needs to change so that you and everyone else can eat in a way that is healthy, sustainable for our planet, and that everyone can afford. And our participants met uh, over the course of four weekends. They met um, live on the first and last weekend, and they met digitally on the uh, Saturdays in between. Uh, they were a group of about 60 participants, more or less. We had the youngest participant uh, was 16 years old and the oldest was over 80 years old. And you can imagine these people coming into the room to discuss and answer these questions together. And that resulted in over 50 different recommendations that were gonna be delivered to the agency and uh, implemented into a national directive. Um, some of these um, participants, I, can, I guess you can say broadly that the recommendations were in favor of uh, regulation and taxation of what is bad and enabling what is good, very, very broadly. But we can discuss more about that later. I want to say something about the design and the deliberation, because what we found was that this group of people uh, were so motivated, so engaged, and took on this task with a high level of commitment, responsibility, and joy. And I think part of the, um, the way that we design these processes is to really include that perspective in co-creation and finding that joy and wanting to change things. I'm gonna say just a few words on what's gonna happen in 2024. So not only will we have, uh, as Tim spoke about, a national uh, climate assembly, we are also going to have a, a first municipal citizen assembly in Gothenburg. And uh, we are going to be selecting 30 representative participants from all different parts of the city and they are going to be meeting over the course of three weekends to answer the question of how can the citizens in Gothenburg be more active in, um, in the transition process. And I'm going to hand it over to our representative from Gothenburg who's going to talk more about the implementation there. So thanks for me. Thank you so much, Steph. So yes, with that, I would like to invite the final um, speakers for today, uh, who are then Christina Ebert, who's from the Administration for Democracy and Citizen Services, I think is the, the correct English translation, at uh, the city of Gothenburg, and her colleague Mats Alfredsson, who's from the Environmental Administration. So please, Christina and Mats. Are you? So, sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> no uh, worries. Uh, just a second. Um... So I can just uh, say that we also, um, this will be sort of the final um, part of, of uh, the presentations and especially to situate this in the municipal context. And I happen to know, and I see also in the uh, attendee list here, that there are a lot of uh, representatives from municipal municipalities around Sweden. So I know this is also something that's that's bubbling out there. A lot of municipalities are discussing. So please, Christina and Mats, share a few of your thoughts and, and experiences for the process in Gothenburg. Yes. You. Can you see our presentation? Uh, yes. Yes. OK. Um, uh, I, I work, uh, Mats Alfredsson, I work at the Environmental Administration of Gothenburg, and I'm uh, environmental expert and strategist uh, working with uh, one of the seven cross-sectoral strategies of the environmental program for 
for Gothenburg. And one part of that is to uh, create different um, sort of positive situations in, in, in co-creation with, with, with business and civil society and the citizens. Yes, and <laughs> my name is Christina Iabet, and I work at uh, the Administration of Democracy and Citizen Service as a planning leader, planning manager for uh, democracy and uh, focus on uh, youth. And we have uh, very big challenges in Gothenburg that differ somewhat from other big cities. We still have a very sort of strong industrial structure in, in Gothenburg and, and, and sort of regional local uh, emissions from, from the city. And we need to accelerate and speed up the transition because we, we cannot do this um, uh, in a sustainable manner, socially and democ democratically. Uh, without the citizens. So that, that's sort of the background. And the, the, the thoughts behind this test, because we're actually doing a test of this method, method that you, you heard about, uh, the citizen assembly method, is, um, uh, yeah, we want to try this method and we, and, and we, we see that, th so we, me and Christina is going to tell you a little bit more about these thoughts uh, in, the, in the next coming minutes. Yeah. yeah, why we're doing it. Why we're doing it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we need to increase the knowledge and competence about methods and tools for dialogue. Uh, and we need to do this especially to access the experience of marginalized groups. Uh, because we know that these groups are the ones who rarely get heard in other forms uh, of dialogues that the city offers. Yes. and. Um... At the same time, we want to create meetings and dialogue between people from, from different uh, target groups uh, and listen, uh, that can listen to each other and together they can come up with proposals for solutions that otherwise would not have been arisen if, if sort of only one target group, that, that's the usual way we work. We have sort of one target group, business or civil society. Uh, so we, we, we the hope is that we, by collective intelligence, we can we can um, create more uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, so that that's that's part of this test, hmm. so to speak. And we believe that uh, this uh, these met methods and this method uh, complements and support the development of the representative democratic system. And therefore, we explore new areas to give the citizens increased participation and influence, but under controlled conditions. And uh, last but not least, uh, all of this is, uh, of course, important for providing a better basis for decision ma making within the city. So many municipalities and not have not and not least uh, in the EU, often talk about instead of doing and working for the citizens, we need to work more with the citizens. And, and can we do this with, through deliberative methods as we've heard about? Can this also strengthen democracy? Is, is, it would be wonderful. And Gothenburg, like many other cities, have a, a quite problematic current uh, situation involving both environmental and social issues. Uh, and the societal challenges sort of look like this in, in the city. We have a lack of participation in the transition, that's quite clear. And the transition, we've just had a, a, a fresh report that, that shows that we have uh, the, the, the transition, the pace of the transition is way too slow. Yes, and we also have a lack, lack of trust between people and uh, in authorities. And uh, we also have a failing representation, uh, that is uh, difficulties in reaching all the people of Gothenburg. And we also have uh, low voting turnout and trust in elected officials. And also against elected officials and also officials. And in our desired uh, future situation, we want to achieve this. Yes, we, we think that, that uh, this process, if we, if we extend this, the learning processes from this test of this uh, uh, 
citizen assembly, we think we can increase the, the trust in the city. And, 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 and I mean, not only the city of Gothenburg, but the city as a, uh, as a big regional society, so to speak. Uh, so, so, so the level of trust in the city can, can, can be enhanced. And we also think that the, that the electoral participation, the participation in, 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 uh, in elections could increase. And we think that we could improve the representation and reduce hatred and threats. Yes, and we believe also that uh, we get a more anchored and accelerated transition as was one of the big challenges. So yeah. A deeper that we can accelerate the transition and, and speed up the measures for the transitions. Yes. Yes, and um, most of you might be familiar with the participatory ladder and it's uh, different step stones. Uh, it's from uh, this one for more information and in participation. You, you, you may, might, might have heard of it, a lot of you. Um, this one was this one was uh, developed by Sherry Arnstein in the 60s and then uh, by SQR uh, for a Swedish version. And our administration has developed a new version of the participatory ladder into what we call a participation map. Uh, this map contains a framework that will help us to locate the right question and start from there and not starting by choosing method, which often is the case. Uh, and our participation, uh, no, we, uh, yeah, our participation map also includes uh, citizens' needs for and desire for participation and influence, and also the openness and capacity of the city's administration in engaging with citizens. Uh, we developed this map because we believe uh, crucial success is to match the citizens' needs and willingness to participate uh, with the city's cap capacity to create participation for citizens, uh, what we call a meeting point. <clears throat> uh, and we also need to understand where citizens want to be in the participatory map. Uh, if there's an issue that will be at the arise a lot of discussion among citizens, which means they want to be uh, high up on this map. Uh, the city of Gothenburg needs to be there too. Uh, and if we can start matching correctly, uh, it will contribute to and increase the chances of achieving this uh, desired social outcome and future situation. I can say just one comment is that we have within the city, we have uh, quite a lot of experience uh, concerning information, consultation, dialogue, but not as much uh, concerning influence and co-decide. So mm -hmm. that's also part of this test that we, we want to try out methods for the influence level and the co-decide level. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> as you might know, all these uh, meeting points or steps are equally important. And uh, it is the question that determines uh, the need. And many times as a citizen, you are satisfied with the information. Uh, one example is a social service act. Uh, that one is not negotiable. Connected to a law like, uh, like it is, uh, this information is often the, um, the only possible way of communicating, communication. And, <clears throat> If the issue is complex, uh, the question will force us up the map uh, and we cannot use method and approach approaches that work on meeting points such as information and consultation, but we need to design the work based on meeting points such as influence or maybe co-decide. Hmm. Um, and here you can see this yellow line that we call a break point. Uh, it's a kind of tipping point for complexity and tension. Um, uh, this is where things can create tension and be more complicated. Uh, here we exchange more perspectives with, with each other and start to share power. Uh, and uh, important is also that uh, if it is a complex issue, there are often several meeting, meeting points 
of this participation map that needs to be used. And uh, to our aid, we have uh, very wise politicians <laughs> in our city uh, who has given us a couple of common guidelines in regard of paragraphs in our steering documents, uh, which shows us uh, which shows how to how important and right the joint responsibility for democracy is. Uh, the fact that we have a special committee for democracy and citizen service in combination with this paragraph that describes uh, the responsibility of all the committees uh, to create the conditions for participation is unique in Sweden. Uh, there is a great potential in this because we are doing it together in all the boards and administrations. And the same goes for this sixth paragraph that also is, is also uh, uh, written for all the administrations in, in the city. And, and uh, every committee must conduct integrated and proactive sustainability work aimed at achieving the goals of Agenda 2030. So uh, we actually have on, on paper, we have quite a strong steering mechanism co connected to these issues that this, uh, uh, yeah. These issues we're talking about connected to the citizen assembly. Uh, one reflection uh, at last, uh, the participatory processes require innovative organizations. We come across in this process, which has gone on for one and a half year, uh, me, our two administrations, me and Christina, and, and um, this is not um, a unique for Gothenburg, but, but uh, uh, most commonly we, we as a municipality work with the inside and out perspective, so to speak. We ask uh, the, citizen of, the citizens of their views on issues that we decide, that we find difficult or that the law requires that we need to do that to, in the planning process of new, new uh, residential areas, for example. Uh, and it's, um, it's a very much uh, uh, from the inside to out. What do you think about what the municipality is, is planning to do? But uh, the, the different approaches connected to the citizen assembly uh, requires that we, we actually act and think in, a, in another matter, which is more outside and in perspective, where you have to listen to what the civil society and the, and the citizens actually are thinking, what their needs are. So it's, it's a change process for us to, to be able to, to meet that sort of uh, need. Uh, and that in, it requires an innovative organization that, that, that doesn't focus on the the sort of structure that we have today and the boxes that we have defined. So this is a, a sort of a big learning process for, for the city too, that we need to, to have a more uh, innovative organization or an organization that supports the, not only the institutional logic that we have today, the bureaucratic system. If, of course, it's necessary to, to handle uh, law, laws and, and regulations and so on. But we need an organization that also supports the experimental and innovative logic. That is, uh, is quite clear in the process of this work for us. Yeah. And that's our final word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, Christina and Mats will stay on the screen and I then uh, welcome all the panelists to um, start their video sharing. And so we've had a lot of questions in the Q&A and I also we have a, a quite a few interesting topics I think for uh, for discussion. So I hope now um Jonathan will help us to to pin perhaps the panelists that you should all be seeing. Uh but I want to start with uh, one of the questions that received a lot of uh, thumbs up in the Q&A and that was also answered um by Matilde already. Um but what are some recommended tactics to convince politicians to initiate these types of processes? And maybe I'll first actually pose that question to, to Christina and, and Mats. <laughs> what are, um, in, in the context of Gothenburg, uh, have, you, have you had to, to actually apply any tactics to convince politicians? Or <laughs> what, what has the 
debate there been? Uh, because as the, the question also poses, this can take a lot of time and be seen as costly. And if you don't have resources, this this will be an issue. But uh, have you yeah, undertaken any such tactics? <laughs> no, I don't think we had any tactics, and it did. It has been. It has taken a lot of time. Mm. I mean, we've been working with this for one and a half years. Yes, something like that. Mm. And uh, it's, we even had a debate in house, so to say. Is there is this process and this project is it anchored uh, by the elected officials or not? And uh, somehow it is because it's a project, and uh, you know if if we're in a project, then it's uh, anchored. <laughs> but mm. but on which detail level, I don't know. <laughs> so, mm. but now after one and a half year, maybe that's been quite obvious. I think mm. that we need that. Um, sometimes we need a lot of time to to process things and uh, because now we hear that our uh, politici politicians in our boards they are getting interested and they want mm. to join and they want to have a look at it and you know so mm. yeah mm. so it's, right. a, it's a sort of a mentally a slow uh, sort of start and it, it it's um, there are some obstacles to to climb uh, actually and um, yeah, we haven't had any taxes. We, if the, there have been any politicians that have been interested in this, we have answered questions and, and, and attended a meeting with them. But in Gothenburg, it's quite strict. You don't contact politicians. Mm. It's, it's part of the, the, the policy. So it, it's, we can only talk to them if they call us or, 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 or arrange in a meeting where to invite us. That's well, cool. we have a different uh, policies <laughs> for that, I yeah. think. But, uh, um, but actually, if we had a tactic from the beginning, it uh, might have been the, because we started to have a conversation with uh, our board. Uh, but then, you know, we have the, like a formal structure for how things should be <laughs> debated or, or um, mm. yeah. And, and uh, so I think many times it's like you have to go through sort of filters of managers and to have the right uh, or order <laughs> in, mm. in the process. Yeah. And that takes time, I think. So mm. it's, it's a lot of problems or not problems, but uh, yeah. Mm. But a, so some, some of the, you know, to, you, right now, uh, if you can conclude this is a little bit, is that there is an interest among managers in, within the city, and also, uh, you know, some politicians have showed a, a great interest in this. So mm. it's it, uh, it's, that it's not only negative that it has taken time, because now there is we feel that there is an interest for this actually, mm. yeah, and support too. Yeah, so it sounds like a tenaciousness and and kind of. Uh, uh, Perhaps even to the very personal level of the people, i.e., you being yeah. involved in this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. I, I'd like to extend the question also to uh, Mathilde. You answered already in the in the Q and A, but uh, perhaps the international examples that you mentioned of, of tactics or ways of convincing politicians, if you wanted to bring them up also here. Thank you. There is a, a growing uh, discussion among experts and practitioners on how uh, climate assemblies, more broadly speaking, citizen assemblies, juries, uh, can be more powerful, even though they are not convened by uh, governments. It's um, not uh, always possible. Uh, there are many contexts uh, where the governments uh, are not favorable to such uh, process. Um, so we are we have an increased number of examples of uh, such deliberative processes that are organized by civil society organizations with uh, the view to influence uh, at least um, public debates, uh, although governments are uh, not open to, to these suggestions. So these require, uh, as we have already mentioned, strong um, influential strategy. Um, we have the example from France, which is quite unique because the coalition was built um, right after the Yellow Vest protests. So there was already um, a balance of power that was favorable to civil society organizations at that time. And it was a unique um, 
umbrella group that was formed by uh, some members of the Yellow Vests, um, representatives from social NGOs, experts in participatory um, democracy, and some uh, climate um, NGOs. And interestingly, the climate NGOs were the last ones to join the coalition. And, and, and this group uh, had a lot of uh, bargaining power uh, with, with the government. Um, of course, the context can explain that, but I think uh, the fact that um, it was a coalition from different um, horizons, different uh, uh, part of the civil society mattered also a lot. Uh, what the German NGOs uh, have achieved uh, is also quite interesting. So it was not possible for the government to organize a citizens' assembly just before the general election. So the civil society uh, took the lead. And uh, I think they have um, uh, worked on um, to, to have a very comprehensive strategy, um, as I've, I've mentioned, uh, with many different puzzles and pieces. And at the end of the day, they succeeded in uh, inviting uh, the new coalition government to mention uh, the proposals in um, in the coalition agreement. So the we don't know yet if uh, the proposals will be implemented, but at least there was a political commitment. So in a nutshell, we need to put pressure on mm. government. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the examples you bring up is really where there have been perhaps also pressure in terms of medial debate, like the Yellow Vest uh, protests and, and so on. Yeah, thank you. So Tim, what are your thoughts on the tactics to convince uh, politicians? I, I was just reflecting a little bit on our experience, on the experience uh, in Finland that I heard from uh, Finnish colleagues that although that started off with small scale experiments with academics doing it, that basically, Seeing is believing. So when the politicians, if you're able to open up the process, the politicians can actually see and actually, wow, okay, this isn't a bunch of angry citizens I should be scared of. This is a really, oh, this is this is good discussion. Oh, they think like we do. Um, then I think, um, so I think that's sort of snowballed. And so, and now Finland just had an enormous um, deliberative poll with over 600 citizens. So I think, you know, it's it's a, it's a thin end of the wedge and demonstration. So it, it puts a lot of pressure on, uh, making sure it's done well in each case because that's setting the opening up the opportunity and you see that in Ireland where you know they've continued to become more and more mainstream within the political system as as there's more experience of them yeah that's very interesting Haley. that's uh, also a question question of why is there so much happening in Finland on these uh, deliberative processes I'm not sure if I can answer that, but uh, it might be uh, colleagues in the at the University of Turku, and they have been very active in in uh, experimenting with different deliberative designs. So that might be one one reason. Yes, there was a it was called a citizen parliament, and they addressed the citizen initiatives put forward to the to the uh, Finnish parliament, and then the citizens then uh, deliberated on those. So that was one one really interesting experiment. But answering the question that what are the tactics to convince politicians? So I think that uh, we had some uh, focus groups with uh, local police uh, authorities and uh, not yet politicians, but authorities in the city of Helsinki and the Avanta, and they were thinking that these deliberative mini publics are quite nice way of capturing the diverse perspectives that usually the the people who who oppose something development or something they are the most vocal ones they are the most active ones and they might contact the policymakers and say no no we shouldn't have this and that whereas then uh this kind of deliberative forums capture wider perspective and also then it is more balanced and more considerate ones so so based on those focus groups, we also had some ministry focus groups with the Minister of the Environment, Ministry of the uh, Justice and Ministry of the uh, Transport and Communications. And they were basically open to the idea. The problem was resources, as, as always. But but basically, so they thought that this is a kind of a n nice way of capturing the, the uh, informed citizen opinion. And Steph? 
What about your experiences? Have you sort of the examples of tactics that have been used to engage politicians or convince politicians of, of the benefits of these type of processes? Well, I have found that when politicians finally understand what it is that we are trying to do, which is get in touch with their political base, get in touch with their voters um, and understand their concerns and, and be able to act on the community values that they represent, that they're more um, willing to, to look at this. And I also think it's a very good tactic to use um, a test process to say that, look, this is something that we're testing. It's innovative. It's creative. It's a new way for us to work. Let's test it. And just I just want to echo what Tim says and also invite those um, representatives to uh, to those meetings so that they can really see with their own eyes what it means for this type of gr diverse group to meet in a room. Um, and additionally, I want to say that a lot of what we do is also supporting civil servants in navigating their own bureaucratic structures. And we understand how hard it is to come up against those um, very ingrained processes um, that have been around for years. And trying to do something new is very difficult and it can feel very lonely. So uh, if there are any civil servants out there who are fighting on your home front, we hear you, uh, we see you, and it's possible. Yeah, thank you. And and on that note, Christina and Mats, perhaps you're <laughs> as these, uh, I, I shouldn't say um, frustrated um, public officials, but perhaps at some times you might feel as such. Yeah. What what are your thoughts? Yeah, my one, one, one uh, reflection is is that that um, you're talking about the tactics, but but uh, I, I got a different perspective from I mean, we got a different perspective when we, we had a study visit from uh, three members of parliament uh, who, who wanted to, you know, see different examples of sustainability work that we do in Gothenburg about a month ago, and 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 they also wanted to hear us to tell us a little bit about uh, the the coming citizen assembly, and and their reflection was that, my God, this is this is great because we we're lacking arenas now. We we've been losing several arenas to meet uh, the public. Uh, we don't, it's not common, you know, it, people don't uh, show up on, on, on squares when you have, have speeches and you can't knock on people's doors anymore because it's, uh, they're locked. You, you, if you come to a, a diff, you know, different uh, residential areas, you can't, you can't reach people as easy as you could maybe 30 years ago. So they, they, um, they emphasize that this is, this is really interesting for us. Uh, to connect with people between the elections and, and of course during elections too, but mainly between elections. So I found it really interesting, interesting methods. It's not one method, but methods that, that could uh, create new arenas. So I mm. find uh, we found that very rewarding. rewarding. Mm. Yeah. Thank An you. interesting reflection too. Mm. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And I think, so we've touched upon this al already, but a lot of this is, um, Kind of questions of le legitimacy, and and one of the questions posed in the Q and A was kind of how can how can citizen assemblies uh, actually stay or be seen as as trustworthy and independent when they are convened and paid by, for example, the municipality or or the government? And I think maybe Tim, this is also a question. The reasoning for the the climate, the National Climate Assembly, uh, as you said, this is now it's funded through uh, Mr. Fair Trends, and and that becomes sort of. But have you discussed this the funding issue? That was also another question. Um, sort of how do you get funding for these types of processes? And one thing is the municipal funding, and another is perhaps if it's national authorities or if it's uh, civil society based. I, I would imagine even harder to fund, but. Uh, Tim, if you have perspectives on 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 this, um, I know. I mean, in in our case, the funding comes through through research. As a, we have another project as well called Landpass, where we're experimenting with some small scale landscape management deliberative mini publics. Um, and so, I guess that's following the the model that happened in in Finland, where there was some academics sort of doing demonstration experiments, and then there's been more interest as a result there. Um, and I think, as I alluded to, I, th I think the, there's a dispute as to whether 
government funded and government mandated process there are pros and cons so i think you need different things for different um so there are if a government wants particular citizen input to help them with a particular question then that makes sense that they mandate it but if i think that's only part of the potential of deliberative mini publics you know they could also be used to to set agenda to raise issues in the uh, in the public debate which aren't already present or don't get a lot of air um, and there, for that kind of process, then maybe independent assemblies could be more important. And I know that was also a, a question post uh, that you answered, Tim. But are there is there research being done on on more independent or bottom up assemblies? The Klimatrikstan was mentioned, uh, for example. If you want to share your answer, well, just that there are some examples where people have combined. Um, a mini, a strict mini, of course, Klimatrikstag, and if you want to join, you go and join. So it's a self-selecting group. So it's a very different group of citizens. Um, and the idea with a, a mini public or a citizen assembly is that you don't just have the usual suspects and it really is representative of norm, normal people. Um, uh, but then there have been experiments like the People's Plan for Nature in the UK, where there was a combination of a sort of online, you could go and volunteer, you could submit evidence and opinions. And then the the selected mini public, the few people who got the golden ticket to have the conversation in the assembly, they they then drew on that sort of uh, inf evidence that was submitted by interested citizens. So I think there's a lot of experimentation that that could be done there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And, and Steph, I also noticed you. <laughs> there's answering going on also in the Q and A here, but I'll I'll bring that up. Um, yeah, and in, in this question of kind of staying critical um, or not. Um, no, I just uh, added to, you know, the way that we're working on these issues currently is including, of course, an oversight um, committee that is based on actors that are independent from the the body that is um, the governing body that is, you know, ordering the, <laughs> the citizen assembly, uh, so to speak, and um, ensuring that, uh, or at least um, trying to uh, ensure the legitimacy of the process that way. Um, of course, there will always be concerns of uh, democracy washing, and that's something that we have to be very wary of and have mechanisms for and uh, understand those processes as well. But that's uh, that was my sort of um, practical answer on uh, how to deal with the, with the issue of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And I know, uh, Mathilde, that's also something uh, that that you address. This kind of the perhaps you don't didn't use the term democracy washing, but uh, this um, perhaps over reliance or this willingness to, in the context of a uh, uh, de democratizing or or sort of um, yeah society, that these types of processes can be seen as a democracy fix. Now I'm using my own terms for this, but but what what do you <laughs> What do you see the experiences of this? Is there a risk of, of sort of reducing democracy in a sense then to these types of, of um, processes uh, in this de-democratizing general climate? I'm not sure I understand well the, <laughs> your question, but the, there is a, a big debate currently among the experts on um, to what extent um, one-off deliberative process commissioned in very top-down manner by governments with uh, a narrow framing would just legitimize uh, some policies that actually are or not supporting uh, measures needed to, to address the ecological crisis and more broadly speaking, the democratic crisis we are facing. So it's like, just trying to repairing <laughs> to some extent the the a broader issue so they are calls for um politicizing citizens mm -hmm. assemblies and and being bolder um asking i mean basically those experiences are should also highlight new ways uh to organize the public discussion to renew uh, the democratic system they are experimental new uh, governance chambers to some extent so the, some some experts argue that um those deliberative processes shouldn't rely 
so much on governance, but should actually be organized by civil society organizations to have full room for manoeuvre for getting innovative and 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 be aligned with um, with the measures we need um, face of the emergency. Uh, yeah, so it's a nice. it's a big discussion <laughs> going on. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Haley, perhaps with your experiences from, from the Finnish case, um, what was the, the the debate leading up to the Uisma, the, the sort of this view on uh, these type of democratic processes? Uh, was this something that was seen as, as really this kind of complementary or new way of, of uh, experimenting or govern, kind of governing? Um, or what were, what were the, what were your what were the expectations that you saw? Right. So, <clears throat> I think that it was the Uusima Regional Council that they were, they first they were uh, quite keen to experiment with new, new forms of uh, democratic governance, and then they were also quite concerned that they they had this very ambitious idea that Uusima should be carbon neutral. Uh, by 2035, and uh, and they knew that it, it is transport. The major changes have have take place there, and they also knew that that there is the le legitimacy is a major issue there because even though uh, s some deliberative th 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 theorists assume that that citizens can propose more innovative and unsustainable solutions than politicians, but on the other hand, it's it is quite challenging to have people who are used to drive their own cars to to give up that. So it's not that sort of straightforward that people would always be more more uh, in, environmentally oriented than policymakers. So then it was. In a way, the other way around, that the the authorities in Uusimaa region, or those people who were in charge of the, uh, uh, let me see, climate, uh, well, they had a climate program, climate roadmap. So they they wanted to sort of like have have more support for from from the citizens for, for the project. So I guess that was the, their main motivation that they they hoped that. That when people uh, actually see that uh, there is a real need to reduce uh, carbon emissions and and the transport is the ma major problem, so then they will be more willing to to accept some measures. And to some extent, that was the case. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think a, a lot of the other questions that have come up here also regards. Um, who is really involved? So who is seen as a citizen in these citizen assemblies? Uh, and I think this is also a, a reoccurring and we've had um, a few examples from the presentations of how selection processes and the criteria may, may look like. Um, but could you perhaps elaborate a bit more? If I start with you, Steph, how do you, how do you work within these types of processes and in your Sort of um, collective experiences at the uh, Digi Dem Lab. How can you assure um, principles of, of justice in the selection of, of participants? There we go. Um, yeah, justice, that's a big word. I think um, I like to think of um, how can we represent the different demographic, you know, um, issues that we're trying to bring up here. I mean, usually we're talking about age, we're talking about uh, gender, geography, education or income uh, levels. Um, and then also, you know, additional questions about attitude or political views. And um, so what we found is that um, when we send out these broad invitations, um, we want to try to get people to answer or give people the option to answer the, these demographic questions in a way that opens it up a little bit. So, for example, we don't have any statistical uh, data on the number of non-binary people, uh, but we do have people answering that this is their gender identity. So how do we incorporate that perspective, for example, or represent uh, those voices in our citizen assemblies? Or uh, when we ask people about um, their minimal level of education. We have some people who have no education at all, and that actually doesn't show up in our statistical 
um, documentation beforehand. So creating categories um, in our surveys uh, is one way to include underrepresented groups. Um, another way to include underrepresented groups, and I again, justice is a very big word, but uh, I'm talking practically, um, is about how we uh, make these design choices. Um, do we actually, um, and I think somebody in the comments brought this up, pay people um, an amount of money that is equivalent of what they would make if they were working. Because we have in the past had the experience of folks not being able to participate because they had to work. And that is a reality. And that is something that um, becomes problematic when we say that we want to include the voices of all our citizens. And uh, in terms of citizens, I mean, it's the people who have uh, their civil registration in, in Sweden. Those are the databases that we have access to, uh, at least for the case of Sweden. So um, those um, that methodology is very accessible to us here. Mm. Um, yeah, mm. I'll let somebody else jump in. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll pose the question to Tim, because I know this has been a, a question also in the National Climate Assembly. Um, and, and you actually refrain from talking necessarily about representation, because maybe it's also a point of actually bringing in groups that are not heard. So in a sense, kind of skewing, uh, purposefully skewing the representation. Um, would you say something about that process and how you've thought about this? Yeah, um, we, we stopped talking about representation when we kept getting a lot of critique from political scientists or, or people who do surveys and 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 of course 50 people can never be statistically representative you need kind of hundreds of people to do that so while you're trying to get a group that captures the diversity that's the terminology that we switched to to sharpen our ter terminology there we're trying to reflect the diversity of society but we, we we don't claim statistical representativeness of course um so that's one thing another thing then is so for the red boy rodom climatic we're going to try and mirror the population so we have statistical, we have a, a recent survey on climate opinion, for example. We have polls on um, political party voting intentions. So uh, we're just trying to mirror. There are 10% uh, of people um, don't care, don't worry about the climate. So that means we want to have five citizens out of our 50 who don't worry about the climate, five citizens who um, are neutral and 40 citizens representing the 80% of people who say they do worry about the climate. So we're just trying to mirror directly. We haven't made any decisions to skew it or to overrepresent any groups. But in another example, for example, where we've been discussing processes with um, uh, biosphere reserves um, in Voxnadal and in Yevlubori, uh, or a proposed biosphere reserve in the Stockholm archipelago, there you have people who live there and there's only about 70 people. And then you've got several hundred people who have summer houses there or live there part time. And then you've got several thousand people who visit there. So, so there you need to act that that situation forces you to think, okay, what's the what's an appropriate, what's a fair balance between those? So is it going to be a third of them are the permanent people? So a very high percentage of those, and then a third and a third. So you are kind of skewing it, but you're sort of saying, well, these different groups, although there's many more of these, this group should have a greater say. So, uh, And you could also think of other issues where, uh, particularly around climate, where the impacts of the green transition are very much going to be felt in the north and whether, um, you know, particular communities from the north or Sami populations should have a some kind of over-representation. Over um, mm. mm. Yeah, thanks. And Matil, this touches upon you also wrote in, in the comments on this kind of, uh, bringing in perspectives like, for example, discussing climate change of geographies and, and community groups that are more or will be more affected, um, for example. But what are your experiences on this? these issues of representation or not, or how we debate citizens uh, as a group? Yes, thank you. So building on what Tim uh, and Steph have just said, there are only two democratic criteria that we identify across all cases and gender. Beyond that, it really depends on the context and the topics. And when it comes to ecological issues, I think it's really important to look at specific vulnerabilities. The people have very different levels of exposure to climate change and to the impacts of climate measures. So there are very relevant criteria that could be envisaged. Disabilities, uh, geographical locations, as Tiz was just mentioning, um, income, um, 
behaviors, um, energy efficiency, whatever. It depends of, of the topic. Um, I think it's, it's important to work with um, climate adaptation specialists and, and climate experts to select those criteria. Um, and more broadly speaking, environmental experts. I'm not focusing on, on climate here. Interestingly, there are recent experiences that try to go beyond uh, the during by lot to um, give uh, more voice to people who are usually underrepresented, mm. including in uh, in citizens' assemblies and juries. Um, Brussels uh, Citizens Agora and Just Transitions, for instance, uh, decided that a third of the panel will be selected. Uh, so two thirds of, of the people were drawn by lot and uh, a third was, was selected uh, with uh, social NGOs and other actors to really target vulnerable, vulnerable groups. So people who uh, were fired or were about to, to get fired because they were working in uh, very polluting industries or people who were very impacted by impacts of, of climate measures so that they can speak up and, uh, and, and really belong to the conversation. And those people receive specific uh, expert support, so additional support so that they could uh, follow up and, and get engaged in the discussions. Great. And I, I know you also mentioned this kind of how to, um, and this was brought up in the in the Q&A as well, how to sort of groups that are in need of, for example, additional uh, support for child care, or there might be aspects uh, sort of exasperating the inequalities already there in terms of employment and, and gendered roles and, and so on. Um, you mentioned a few examples of how this has been mediated as well, Matilde. Yes, um, sorry, I had a problem with the mic. Um, there are more and more governments, commissioners that are thinking of um, financial compensation, uh, so to pay uh, citizens so that they can exert the right to participate. Um, mostly um, people are reimbursed for their transport cost. They, they receive some compensation package. Uh, in some processes you have um, a child care um, so that people can come with the kids and, and leave them while they are deliberating. Um, but what matters maybe more beyond logistics and, and, and financial supports uh, is a proper facilitation. Um, at the local level, sometimes it's hard for municipalities to uh, commission uh, independent professional NGOs to facilitate the discussions, but it's it's really important um, to make sure that everyone feels at ease to take the floor, to speak up. Otherwise, you always um, you know, meet the, the same flows. In the French Citizen Convention on, on Climate, they tried to give some uh, autonomy to the discussion groups. And what we saw is that the big voices, people with, um, with more confidence were um, speaking far too much, <laughs> much more than other people. So facilitation is, is key and, and expert support, as, as yeah. I mentioned. So yeah. having people that, that can really unpack the information data and walk through um, the, the, the information to digest with uh, vulnerable groups. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So maybe just hearing a bit from Mats and, and Christina on this regarding the the view on citizens and a, a question also emerged uh, that if we understood it correctly, that the, the Climate Assembly in Gotham will, will aim to have about 30 participants. Uh, how have you thought, and you mentioned this in, in your presentation as well, about kind of representation from different parts of the city and so on, but how has that debate uh, gone on for, for you regarding um, who is actually represented or who is voice is getting heard? Yeah, we we uh, we know that uh, in other cases when we you know sort of offer the opportunity to <laughs> to discuss the questions with the city, we don't reach all groups, uh, and it, it is especially than young people and. Mm. Uh, people with low education or uh, low income so that was like a focus for us that we needed to have a sort of secure <laughs> that they will be there <laughs> even though it's very few people so i, I really like uh, tim's uh, thoughts on that that 
we shouldn't uh, maybe talk so much much about representation, but uh, mirroring <laughs> that's much better, I think. Yeah. Mm. But then then you could you could co all, of course also include uh, the environmental aspects of it, and then it becomes more complicated because mm. the environmental impact from people who has uh, sort of very strong and affluent situation in society or position. Um, they have the largest uh, environmental impact. Mm. So, so should they be represented? Uh, should you skew the representation? Mm. So, no, we don't think so. We, because we think people who who don't whose voices are, are not heard, they should be heard in this very important uh, transitional issue of the society. Mm. So, right. so, it's been a discussion within the group who, who's, mm. who's actually designing this process but but uh, maybe mm. not an official discussion <laughs> yeah yeah but thank you for sharing that tim yeah. do you want to yeah, comment yeah just on that? just a reflection on that i mean of course it's the um and the wealthiest people who have the largest footprints uh and so it's extremely important to include them in the conversation and actually there are hard to reach groups because they're marginalized but it's also hard to persuade someone who earns a lot of money to spend their time in your assembly so mm. uh so there's a there's a reverse uh, issue there which um uh which is also a challenge mm. because the, yeah. what you're offering is you know it's not going to be persuasive to someone who has a huge income mm. yeah thank you so there was also a few comments or, or questions which i think is interesting in terms of the the experts that are included um and how these are these are selected and, and what the, the different perspectives uh, given there. And um, also this question about um, sort of, there are both highlighting the emergency and the progress that is being made. How do you balance this between sort of uh, really stressing the, the climate emergency and, and uh, need for action and the science-based um, uh, sort of um, experts on, on that? but also uh, bringing up the examples of technological development and, and deployment or examples from other countries and, and so on. How, how has this been, been mediated? And perhaps I'll give the floor first to, to Haley. Was this something um, in the particular focus on, on transport? How did you mediate or balance between kind of a, yeah, a more emergency, you could say, uh, based, uh, messages or, or experts and more technical uh, input. Right, yeah. <clears throat> so, well, in our case, that was the biggest weakness of our process was that that uh, we should have given the participants an opportunity to nominate the experts themselves. And that's something that, that, that is something that we get most negative feedback in the end of the process. Then the problem was that uh, it was just simply because of a pr pr practical sake. Uh, we, we, there was a limited number of experts that were available, but we should have had more time in the beginning of the process. And at least if the participants would not have known the experts, but they could at least have identified the fields of expertise and types of expertise that could have brought into the process. So that's some, that was a clear lesson learned that next time, if you organize a similar process, you definitely should allow the people to decide that who they want to hear. I think that in the French process and the other processes, that has been the case. Mm -hmm. And also then, there was quite nice, uh, that the, we had kind of top-down process in a sense that the policy options measures were defined, but then the participants, they could also bring sort of bottom up ideas that how to organize everyday life in a less car dependent way as well. So that we could make use of some of the sort of like uh, real life expertise as well. So that compensated it a little bit. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And maybe the Gothenburg local example, how have you thought about this kind of the representation of experts? Uh, I think Steph should answer that, but I, I actually had a question to Helly first. Mm, great, <laughs> uh, because she's. Uh, I think it was quite interesting your reflection because we've heard that the the, the presence of the experts and the, the knowledge enhancing that that's it's really important for the result. But uh, as I interpret your answers, it's it's more like uh, that didn't the the experts and the educational part of the the citizen assembly didn't affect the participants that much was that the, the right sort of interpretation 
Uh, I think it's not exactly the right interpretation. I think that the the participants definitely they they did trust the expert information, like they changed their attitudes towards biofuels because yeah. they learned that there is simply no capacity to produce such amount of biofuel in, in Finland that, that would reduce the emissions. So yes, they did trust the experts, but I think that they nevertheless would have wanted to wanted to have more say in in this issue. But then on the other hand, it, it is a problematic issue because there was one person who would have liked to hear about experts who questioned the phenomenon of, of climate change. And of course, then it's very difficult to bring in, well, you can't find a real expert on that. And then if we would find someone, uh, so then it sort of gives you the wrong, wrong ex impression that that this person would really be an expert. So it, it, it is a challenge. I'm not sure, quite sure how to solve that. But, but uh, so there is a problem with allowing the people to decide the experts themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Mathilde, do you have uh, experiences um, on, on this, the selection of experts? Um, yes, there is a, a growing acknowledgement that experts have to support with integrity and transparency the process. There had been a lot of discussions following the French Convention on Climate because the experts uh, were suspected to be really on the top of citizens' discussions, so to, to drive the discussions somehow too far. Um, there was also a lack of transparency in the way the experts were selected for, for the French Convention, uh, because also the organizers had very limited time to set up the process. Um, examples from the UK, uh, Scotland, Germany um, provide great um, governance models uh, with uh, lead experts or steering committee who are in charge of proposing a list of experts. And this list is then reviewed by advisors uh, from the academia or from the civil society so that there is a multi-step process that makes sure uh, there is a balance uh, in expertise and, and, and stand view, standpoints. Um, after seeing that, <laughs> there is also some concerns among experts about the way the information and the data are shared on ecological issues. Um, a lot of emphasis is put on technology and um, the technical aspects of, of the problem. There is um, recognition that those information have also to be translated, conveyed in more emotional way with more emphasis on uh, the way climate change affects people's lives and how climate measures can also be um, be very transformative and, and have negative impacts. So this is um, a matter of uh, the type of communication supports we use, the images uh, we, we select, uh, the type of witnesses we invite uh, to, to provide feedback, um, yeah, I think recent experiences of, of citizen assemblies tend to provide um, a more diverse uh, in types of information to, to mm. make sure that um, the discussion is, is more open and embrace the complexity of the societal choices that underpin uh, the, the measures. Mm. Right, very interesting. I think if, if this has also been a sort of shift over time from uh, the type of expertise and information. Steph, you've raised your hand as well. What are your experiences on, on this, the expert select, selection and balancing? Yeah, I really appreciated hearing you, Matilda, talking about this because you're you're sort of placing the experiences that we've had in, in that um, context. So um, when we think about um, the information that the citizens or participants are going to be receiving, uh, we think about experts, we think about stakeholders, and we think about witnesses, people who have lived experiences that are relevant information for um, the assembly to take part in. And so the experts might be the part that are more sort of traditionally uh, considered part of academia or have some sort of um, 
specific research that would inform the topic. And in those cases, just like you said, there's a lot of work to do in terms of how they communicate communicate that information to the citizens. Um, how much, uh, how can we basically translate what they're saying into a way that everybody can understand it and also um, feel it. And then of course, in this selection process, which usually has happened in the uh, organizing um, group, uh, we've chosen to also have the oversight committees uh, have a look at that and then get back to us about uh, the composition to make sure that we have representatives from civil society, uh, the different parts of the political spectrum, if that's relevant, um, academia and, and so forth. So I think there's yeah, there's still a lot of evolution happening here in terms of um, what who we consider to be uh, an expert. And I, the one last thing I want to say is that um, it's important to us, um, how can these democratic models also um, include the perspectives of uh, sort of representatives for people who are not there? Like, uh, who is the representative for the rights of, of, uh, of nature or... Um, representatives that can talk about um, climate and colonialism or, or yeah, sort of those issues. So thank you. So we're um, closing in on the end here. A lot of interesting questions, uh, but uh, I just want to give a, a chance for, for Tim and Haley to, to comment on this before the closing word. So Tim. Uh, just a quick observation on the um, on the evidence, the way the evidence is communicated. I, I mean, it, it has been very uh, limited to written and presentation materials. And I think a lot of transdisciplinary sustainability science processes with stakeholder representatives have used all kinds of different interactive embodied learning things. So in the Irish uh, Citizen Assembly on Biodiversity Loss, they did actually go out. Uh, they were out in nature sort of. And, so, and um, as I mentioned before, we're thinking of trying to uh, see if systems thinking tools can help to provide a more um, a, a different kind of educational experience. Um, so I think there's a lot of innovation that could be tried there. It's, it, I think there's a lot of figuring out what it means for the legitimacy of the process. The advantage of speakers and written evidence is that anyone can can read it and it can, it's easier to be transparent. Whereas if, if people go through some sort of transformative experience, it, it, it might feel a bit like people are being brainwashed and then that might undermine the legitimacy of the process. So, But I think there's a lot of experimentation and innovation that could be done there. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Haley. Yeah, just a quick comment that in our case, we uh, relied quite a lot on technical expertise and uh, scientists, but I think that what we should have had is also expertise in ethical issues. I think that the, there could have been a presentation about the Finland's role in, in Finland's responsibility in the sort of global, global climate co context, and that would have changed the discussion because the people who were really not paying attention to this sort of like a regional differences there are rural areas people f f found it difficult to manage without private cars and the fo discussion focused quite a lot of that and if there would have been a presentation about the ethical framework so that might have changed the discussion so that's something that i think mm. that could have been part of i would do that next time yeah thanks great Great. So I think uh, these are, are also joint learnings for this. And I wanted you uh, each to give sort of a final, very brief, so uh, this just a, a sentence, uh, really, of what is your kind of main, if we were to, to take away the potential or risks of climate assemblies or citizen assemblies for, for transitions, what would you see as the sort of major opportunity or risk you, you get to choose and, and make it very brief. And I'll start with uh, Christina and Mats, your hopes perhaps for the spring then, in a sentence. <laughs> I don't know, so you, you can say, <laughs> no, 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 we, we pass, it's, it's just one sentence. We, we, we have to think for one minute. <laughs> yeah, okay. But uh, maybe Tim then, your, your hopes for, for the National Climate Assembly. Well, I hope that it goes well. I hope we can get it organized in time. And I hope that people will reply to our letter. So if anyone gets a letter in January, please do reply. Um, but my hopes more generally is that I think this is a kind of new, it's an old way of doing things, but it's coming up and being applied in new ways. And I think it's, there was learning all the time. So I think as long as we uh, insist on doing it reflexively and as well as we can, this, you know, we don't know how this might 
uh, enrich our democracies going forward in the future and be applied to mm. different areas. That's my yeah. Opinion. Thank you. Enriching democracies, great. Haley, what would you be your risk or opportunity that you see? I guess that I want to have the opportunity. So I think that the sort of the that ordinary people they seldom have the time and opportunity to uh, get familiar with with complex environmental issues. So I think that the sort of transformative potential of these deliberative forums is that it allows people a space to really think about them and uh, sort of re reflect on their initial ideas and assumptions. Mm, yep. Great. Thank you, Steph. What would you say? Oh, you said such good things already, um, both of you. Uh, I think for me, it has and continues to be about transforming the way we think about democracy and involving uh, the most underrepresented groups in the decisions that affect their daily lives. So yeah, involving people in decision-making processes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Mathilde. Well, <laughs> I have many uh, expectations and hopes. Uh, it would be fantastic if in the coming years if citizens assemblies really tackle the biggest controversies raised by the ecological transition, especially um, the implications for social equity. We see all around Europe protests against measures that are seen as unfair, and those protests uh, fuels uh, far right parties to some extent. We have seen that in in Germany and, and in the Netherlands. So it's really important that we harness the potential of citizens' deliberation to foster a broader conversation about the societal choices we have to make. So we need to politicize, in my view, citizens' deliberation so that you know they are getting real, as Claire Melier is saying in a recent article. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And maybe Christine and Mats, you have now what would be your hopes for for citizen assemblies <laughs> yeah um we have two two different thoughts um i think yeah, for our administration it's about building trust uh, between people and between people and the authorities like us and uh and I think it's like we have a responsibility also to offer different arenas for people to have the possibility to meet each other who usually don't meet, or maybe they don't, they don't belong to a community mm. in ordin ordinary day, day life, so to say. So I think that's one important. Yeah, and I, I, I'd like to emphasize um, some aspects that you emphasize too. Um, and it's, it's, it's about accelerating the transition and, and I think it's it's only possible to do that in a sustainable way if if you connect it to fairness and justness. So it has to be a just transition. So I think that's the absolute, absolutely the most important. Mm. Really uh, it's, nice. It's very deep in, in, in humans that uh, that fairness, uh, if you have a sense of unfairness, it's it's very, very strong emotion in, in people. So you have to you have you really have to emphasize that the fair that your transition has to be fair. Yeah, I think there are excellent uh, final words and, and sorry for keeping you all attendees and the panel a few minutes late here, but I think it's been a really rewarding and, and start for a knowledge exchange. And I know, as I said before, we've had a lot of um, municipalities in the audience here as well. This is a concept that's spreading also within Sweden. So I hope we will see a lot of more examples and, and trials of this for opportunities and the risks uh, of, of citizen assemblies for transformation. So thank you all. And uh, by that, we close this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.